Um, so let's welcome Tanya. Thank you very much for both hosting me, inviting me here, and for this lovely introduction. I hope to live up to it. So uh, let's talk about dynamic interaction networks and um, animals and mo as mobile users. So raise your hand. How many of you um, have actually done any network analysis and familiar at all with the terminology? All right, all right. How many of you feel confident about the terminology? <laughs> I'm sorry you'll be bored for the first 20 minutes. <laughs> so, how many of you have seen the network? Oh, yes, good. <laughs> so, here are some examples of networks. Uh, we have uh, networks of interactions. This is a snapshot of what just was happening uh, about 10 minutes ago, up until about 10 minutes ago in the coffee area, right? People talking to each other, people talking to other people, uh, people sending emails to each other or genes, this big hairball, actually it's not that big by gene standards, by network standards, but this, this hairball is uh, genes interacting with each other, regulating up or down. Um, this is a different kind of network, which is more and more common now being created from time series uh, data, and uh, uh, we this is a brain activity network. I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. Uh, anybody knows what this one is? <laughs> a little network. So this is a network uh, of Facebook users where the there is no actual map underneath it. The map is emergent from the nodes being placed at their hometown as indicated on Facebook and the connections just being drawn between uh, friendship connections between Facebook users and it creates the outline of the continents. Uh, and you can see where Facebook is heavily used and not so heavily, a little bit. Like, I, I think, you know, maybe there's, there are a few here. <laughs> Aye, I'm sure if we looked at different um, social networks, we'll find. So before we start, uh, 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 due to the number of raised hands, it will be easy to follow if you know some basic network terminology. And uh, I uh, put a tutorial up available, but uh, for for just basic network analysis terminology. But we'll go very quickly through the whole, through a couple of terms that are necessary to understand what's going on. And in general, for dynamic networks, uh, there is a great book by Peter Holm. Uh, called Modern Temporal Network Theory, and it's available as free PDF or, uh, download from Arca uh, Archive. And um, uh, also a full disclaimer, this is by no means a comprehensive uh, course, intended as a comprehensive course on dynamic network analysis. So what I hope you will take home from this non-comprehensive course is that dynamic networks are really different from static networks. Because even if we look back at this picture, every one of these, we draw these as this kind of snapshot pictures, but they're not. You know, whom you talk to over the coffee break changed even during the course of those 30 minutes. Whom you send emails, that network, that the topology of the network constantly changes, and certainly the brain activity and the all other biological networks are highly changing dynamic entities. And so, because they're different, they, we have to analyze them different and we get different, different information out of them. Most real networks are really dynamic, so we really need to develop a language um, and tools for their analysis. But it is not hard to get started. So let's get started. So um, the, the you know, basic terminology, static or dynamic, uh, we have a network, we have nodes that, are, that represent some entities such as People, zebras, baboons, um, nodes, uh, sensors, or or, or um, brain cells, and there are connections between them. And that's about kind of the start of it. So the types of thing. Why do we need a network in the first place? Because networks are more than just connections between nodes. 
the collection of connections between nodes. Networks really are a model of the overall interactions of the emergent properties that happen at the level of the system as a whole by the collection of these pairwise interactions. And we believe by using a network as a model, and we'll talk a little bit more about what does it mean to use a network as a model, by using a network as a model, we believe that it gives us more information just, just looking at pairwise interactions uh, as, a, as a list of pairwise interactions. Right. And so what we typically like to do with a network, and the reason we were using network analysis in the first place, is that we, we want to do things at a very abstract level, things like predict the type or color of a given node in a network. We want to, for example, predict uh, gender, or whether it's a spam email or not, or whether um, it's a high-ranking baboon in a population, or uh, what's the location of a particular uh, p a position, as in ge geographic position, of a particular uh, zebra going to be in five minutes. So that kind of give a label of what kind of music you're going to be listening, or you're listening, what's the genre. So these kinds of labels uh, we believe our property in, uh, uh, function not only of, uh, of, of you, yourself, the node itself, but also uh, of the structure of the entire network. So this is node classification. We want to predict uh, whether two nodes are linked or not, or will be linked. That's link prediction. We typically want to identify things like densely connected, densely linked uh, clusters of nodes, um, also called community detection. Uh, or measure similarity of two nodes or two networks, and uh, so network similarity. And so the example of applications of things like this, so uh, for node uh, classification, for example, we misinformation, uh, identifying uh, hoax articles in Wikipedia where the nodes in this network are uh, articles in Wikipedia and the links are hyperlinks between articles. And so it turns out that uh, their particular structure of the network, that the real nodes are much more uh, con coherently connected than the hoax ones. And so uh, that's a paper, there's a reference, the Wikipedia ho hoaxes by Kumar et al. Right, so um, we want, for link prediction, a classic example is recommender systems. When um, uh, you by a whole bunch of, let's say in this case, a uh, bunch of items that appear in Pinterest connections, and uh, you link an item to the collection that it shows up, and you want to, to find the missing links, the ones that uh, this item should be appearing in this collection, but it's not, and so you want to recommend essentially this link. So that's a link prediction application. Um, community detection, and that's a, uh, so that's work, actually, a lot, of, a lot of people have done this kind of work. In fact, Netflix Prize several years ago was won by adding network uh, analysis to, to recommender system, typical um, applications. So for community detection, uh, polarization on Twitter, uh, for example, is a, uh, and it's a dynamic application because uh, if you look at nodes uh, as Twitter accounts, Twitter handles, and links between following relations, um, this is sort of, the, the colors here correspond to the clusters in the network itself. And it's essentially moved from this kind of thing initially over time to this, where two groups are highly polarized in their opinions and start separating. Um, cascade is a spreading processes for such as opinion products or viral uh, posts. Uh, or diseases, so spreading processes is a big application of network analysis, and uh, you want to look at uh, starting, let's say, from this node. Uh, in this case, it's uh, invitation on LinkedIn. It's spread to this one, which then spread to these ones, and so on. So that's called a cascade, so a cascade like this. Uh, you want to identify the source of the cascades. You want to intend to be able to identify nodes and characteristics of nodes that initiate large cascades. Uh, and uh, predict the scope of a cascade, both in the disease, both in a disease and kind of marketing uh, context. So, um, function prediction. So, big is one of the biggest uses of networks as a structure is not for the network analysis in and of itself, but what uh, 
so the network structure tells about the the, the nodes and the uh, nodes and the uh, links between those nodes. And uh, one of the most common in biology is protein function prediction. So in th this case, the nodes are different genes and proteins. And this, in modern molecular biology, it's essentially interchangeable. Um, and so this is, uh, and, and the connections between them, between two proteins, are if they're interacting in some sort of way. And uh, the function of the red ones is known, and then we don't know the function of the blue ones. But the structure of the network, and by clustering uh, nodes by in the network, we can uh, then infer the function of the missing uh, of the proteins for which the function is missing by putting them in the right uh, by being associated with a cluster of nodes with similar function. Okay, so let's get to it. Hopefully. You got to the point where e every talk starts on networks, that networks are cool, networks are important. Um, let, let's, let's start figuring out uh, how to deal with them. So uh, a network is a collection of objects uh, where some pairs of objects are connected by links. So ta-da, nodes, edges, and uh, the system itself is a network or a graph. And actually, we distinguish between network and graph by saying that networks are labeled graphs. So there is more information than just topology. Uh, so the important, first important choice, therefore, when we start, we never actually start with a network, right? We start with data. Nobody is walking around with sticks of con indicating connections that, oh, look, we're interacting right now. This is a connection, right? No. We have data on emails and interactions on positions, uh, locations of, of baboons or zebras or ants, on uh, time series of brain cells or interactions between uh, proteins. And by interactions between proteins, we mean, oh, there is a physical reaction or there is a potential proximity in the same uh, part of the cell. So these are not actual uh, actual, as I said, firm links that are, form that, are, that are visible. Even when we talk about humans, we say, okay, two humans are interacting if they maybe are you know, talking long enough or animated enough. And I ask biologists, what do you mean by, what do you call uh, two zebras interacting? How do you know that they're interacting? Well, animals are interacting, turns out, I didn't know that, if they're within two body lengths of each other for long enough. So close enough for long enough. So close enough two body lengths. For humans, that means what? About, uh, what, four meters? <laughs> three and a half meters? So I don't interact with everybody I'm within three and a half meters of, right? <laughs> and even if I stand, the, stand there long enough, I'm still not directly interacting with you, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, so we have to figure out how to go from data to network and what's a meaning, meaningful definition of an edge and what's a meaningful definition of a node. And it is particularly sort of it's all amplified when we talk about dynamic networks. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more. So the second thing we need to figure out is what is the choice of network representation? So whether it's uh, undirected or directed, uh, in undirected, such as collaborations or friendships, although not all friendships are symmetric, right? So uh, <laughs> some friendships are very directed. Um, and, uh, or directed networks such as phone calls or following on Twitter. Um, and so that brings us immediately to one of the first indicators of, uh, in first quantities in network analysis is no degrees. And the joke uh, with obsession of no degrees and no degree distribution is uh, so graph theoreticians claim that that's why the reason everybody's obsessed with it is because it's the first page of graph uh, uh, of, of graph theory textbooks. <laughs> so, so here it is, ta-da, no degree is just the number of links incident or of a particular node, and you can distinguish between uh, in-degree and out-degree in a directed graph, and so you can also look at, about, uh, at average degree. And the reason we actually um, talk about average degree uh, quite a bit is because it is used in network analysis, it's used as a proxy for density. So density of a, of a graph is the number of edges in the graph over the total number of possible edges, right? What's the total number of possible edges in any graph? Well, and choose two, right, if you have n nodes. 
but it's the same quantity for every n degree n, uh, n node graph. So we don't we forget about it. We just look at average average uh, degree as a uh, equivalent function. Uh, so we typically and it's much quicker sort of to compute approximately because you don't have to count any edge. You kind of start going through a sample of node degrees. Okay. So, so let's look at some real networks. So there is internet, uh, World Wide Web. Everybody knows the difference, right? Uh, power Grid, mobile phones. So uh, if you look at the number of nodes, these are still kind of medium size, getting to uh, small to medium sized networks in the thousands or to hundreds of thousands. So citation network, half a million uh, nodes. And then uh, all of them kind of have on the, the order of magnitude more links, which if you look at the average degree, so most of them, except for maybe the actor network, which is incestuous, um, I mean in terms of who is in the movie with whom. So <laughs> most of these average degrees are pretty low. These networks are very, very sparse. And that is typical of most real world networks. They're really sparse. Average degrees are, are typically on, uh, around two, three, if you're lucky. Okay? So, um, that's what, that was the node attributes. Um, the edge attributes, we typically look at things like weight, ranking, um, best friend, second best friend, right? So, it's uh, type, friend or relative, coworker, um, the, the Sign, positive or negative, so friend versus foe. We sometimes put both types of edges in a, in a network. And really, these properties depend on the, the, on the structure of the rest of the graph and number of common friends and so on. And so with edges, uh, what edges bring into this whole structure is really edges are about connectivity. And we Look, the very basic thing is whether a graph is connected or disconnected, and we can look at the connected components. And one of the things interesting about networks is that there is typically networks... So networks are not connected, but they do have this giant connected component. So many networks, what happens is that they have this structure. First of all, in terms of the degrees, the distribution of the degrees is not that because the average is about three, that everybody ha just has three friends. No, some people have, if you look at Facebook or LinkedIn, right? Some people have a thousand friends and some people have one. <laughs> and in fact, many, many, many more people have small number of friends, but there are these outliers that have 7,000 people they call friends. I don't know who they are. But um, the same kind of structure is similar um, in, in, it has of degree distributions is similar in most networks, and also this notion of giant connected components. So many networks have this one, more than half of the nodes, including that include more than half of the nodes of a connected component, and then there are kind of whiskers and little stars and pure isolated nodes, poor guys. So how do we measure a network? So as I said, we look at things like degree distribution or path length distribution and cl clustering coefficients and connected components. So let's quickly go through this, it's terminology. So degree distribution is purely the histogram of the number of nodes of any given degree. So in this particular network, this is what it would look like. But in general, on a log log plot, it, it looks kind of like this. So, which means that you have many nodes with very low degree and then fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer, exponentially fewer and fewer nodes with high degree. And uh, you often, because it's this very steeply dropping exponential function, you often see it being plotted on a log-log uh, plot, on a log-log scale. And then people say, oh, look, on a log-log scale, this looks like a line. Right? So careful. There be danger here. Don't do this. Don't fit a line on a log log scale, on a log log plot. <laughs> because 
If you fit a line, meaning something like least square error fit of a line on a log log uh, plot, right? Basic high school algebra. We fit a line to minimize the additive error, right? An additive error on a log log plot, on a log log transformation, means a multiplicative error for the original function. So don't do this. Fit, there are ways to fit, uh, to test whether your, uh, whether your data is distributed actually as a power law, uh, expo uh, exponential function, log normal, because they all look pretty much identical on a log log scale. So, uh, but what is true is that this long tail, highly skewed distributions are characteristic. You don't see kind of normal curves of uh, degree distributions in, in networks. All right, paths. So paths uh, in graphs are just connections of linked nodes and can intersect itself or just or not. And the, um, the thing is the distance in graphs are important, distance in networks are important, that um, how far away B is from D Right? Uh, the further away you are from somebody in the network, the, it seems that the less actual connection, but things can still spread. So paths are really the infrastructures through which information, diseases, and everything else spreads in networks. Right? So we look at uh, things like network diameter, which is technically the maximum length of a minimum shortest, uh, the maximum length of a shortest path between any two nodes in a network. Well, Maxima are uh, really hard to compute and they're highly unstable because it can add one link and like drastically shorten a whole bunch of paths, including the maximum. I can cut a link and increase it by a lot. So this is a very unstable quantity and so in networks we typically don't use the actual maximum of our all shortest path. What we do in networks is use the 90th percentile of path lengths somewhere or some other high percentile, right? Because, uh, or, or essentially the path length distribution or the average path length is an indicator of how long in general are the paths. And you probably have, s have heard the term uh, six degrees of separation, right? Um, yes, no, maybe? People are still awake, right? Okay, good. So uh, this is a 1960s experiment by this radical, um, uh, radical uh, psychologist, Milgram, who among, you may have heard uh, about him from this experiment of people, how people are prone to torture, or torturing other people. Um, that was repeated recently, but he also did this experiment where he sent a, a whole bunch of env 100 envelopes to people in Oklahoma, asking them to forward it only through personal connections. And Oklahoma, if, you don't familiar, if you're not familiar with U.S. geography, is way west, it's the Wild West. It's kind of way west from the destination point, which is Boston, which is the, one of the most eastmost cities in the United States. It's on the coast, up north on the east coast. So. Uh, he wanted these people from Oklahoma to forward these envelopes to, to a lawyer in Boston, but only through personal connections. Each time the envelope can be only passed through somebody whom you know on a first name basis. And so uh, when uh, the experiment was done and these envelopes showed up in Boston, and the shocking thing was that the envelopes showed up in Boston, right, from Oklahoma through personal connections. Uh, he counted the number of hops that the envelopes went through and turns out on average, the, the maximum, not on average, the maximum number of hops was six, which is wow, right? So the six degrees of separation, uh, the, the world is really a small world. The d detail that's often omitted in this is that uh, of these hundred envelopes, only 13 actually showed up in Boston. <laughs> So the maximum number of hops in this experiment is infinity, <laughs> right? 87 envelopes did not show up in Boston. They never made it. The network is not connected. 
But, you know, with Facebook, we're now actually discovering that this giant connected component thing, the, yes, there are nodes that are not connected to the rest of the world, but uh, with this giant connected component, the diameter there, the, the, not the maximum, but kind of 90th percentile-ish, uh, path lengths are pretty small, and they're getting down to eight hops, eight. So you're eight degrees of separation from some, anybody else in the world who is part of this giant connected component. Anybody who counts, really, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, with that, clustering coefficient, which is a related quantity, is the uh, proportion of a node's neighbors that are connected among themselves. So how many of your friends are friends among themselves? Right? That's the clustering coefficient. How many triangles are there, there in this network, essentially? And so, uh, and again, it's the number of edges among your neighbors versus k among your k neighbors versus the number of possible k choose two edges that could be there. Okay, and we can talk about uh, uh, degree dis uh, clustering coefficient distribution, average clustering coefficient for the system or just measure the total number of triangles in the, in the, in the whole uh, network, uh, which gives us the, the, the measure of sort of the, the connectivity and the fragility of that connectivity. So not only the path lengths, but how much redundancy there is in this, in the, in the system. That's what clustering coefficient essentially measures. So what have we learned so far? Degree distribution, path lengths, clustering coefficients. So this is kind of the first measures that people used in general uh, to, or to compare networks. So remember network similarity, yeah? So uh, if we look at, so here are these four categories here, social information, technological, and biological. And uh, so the number of nodes varies. Uh, the number of nodes here varies from uh, 40, uh, no, here. Uh, who remembers Alta Vista? <laughs> and, <laughs> but 200 million at the time, much more than that now, to I think the smallest network in this collection is 92 nodes, and which is a biological network of uh, who eats whom in fresh water, which species are eating each other. But Again, then if you look at the, uh, the, the average degree, it's still, for the most part, in single digits. These are still very sparse networks. And the clustering coefficients are tiny, so these are not, the, there's not a lot of triangles. And whatever triangles there are, they're very local. They're kind of clustered in this local uh, clusters, which we'll talk about and talk about communities. And then the rest of the network is this long, thin pathway, pathways, right, barely connecting each other. All right. So let's talk about dynamic networks, unless there are questions. And don't be shy, because this is a combination is going to be sort of jumping up and down in levels of abstraction and talking about this very basic intro into network analysis. And then we're going to talk about applications and machine learning and then go back to uh, intros and definitions. So if there are any questions, raise your hand. Ask, don't raise your hand. So dynamic network, and this is thanks to Peter Home, a lot of this um, sort of definitions. So we typically start with data, and then we have to do talk about how we define the network, talk maybe close enough for long enough or other. Uh, do we, for example, do we take orientation into consideration? Do they have to face each other? or just stand next to each other, who knows? Um, and then we'll talk about network representation. So actually representation in and of itself matters. We lose information when we sort of combine uh, even the definition of a network. And then, then we look for patterns and structure in, in that representation, and then hopefully it gives us some application insight. And then we go and collect more data and uh, never run out of uh, work to do. So. Let's start with a cycle. So most of my networks are networks of animals, so social animals. I work with biologists who are interested in social behavior of animals, and so for the most part, biologists are collecting data like this. 
it's observation based science and they, they would rather spend a lot of time in the field. So these guys, this is one of my former postdocs, uh, David Papano, and he's, uh, work, he was working on uh, these primates. They're called gelada, not ice cream. And uh, these are the only known fully completely herbivore uh, primates. They're baboon-like things in uh, animals in uh, Ethiopia. And they're very docile. You can stand there and watch them, right? So you can uh, figure out who's whose friend. And, uh, but even here, I don't know if you noticed, there are more, more of gelata here, more there, and with three people watching, you really cannot be watching everybody all the time. You miss quite a bit of information. So this way of data collection was very sparse, and it didn't require computers, really. But recently, biologists started collecting data in a very different way. So one thing I found out, that at the level of abstraction that we do, uh, algorithms for network analysis, it really doesn't matter whether it's zebras, baboons, ants, or humans. The biggest difference between zebras and humans turns out that, to my shock, zebras do not have Facebook. So, <laughs> so how do you collect information about who's whose zebra friends? Or ant, for example. So uh, scientists started doing uh, this kind of thing. So this is a QR code uh, glued on an ant. In Switzerland, this is a project from University of Lausanne, and uh, that's clearly a job for a graduate student. So <laughs> then you put a whole bunch of them. So they have um, about 50 nests, I think, their styrofoam configuration, and they have cameras mounted over each uh, nest, and these ants are running around with a QR code. And occasionally, you see here, there are some like, links that form. And this is really close enough for long enough definition which may or may not be the right thing. You can color code your ants if you don't like uh, QR codes or, or write numbers on your bumblebees or tattoo you tunger, your tungara frogs in Texas. And these are ultraviolet tattoos with numbers. Um, zebras, uh, you can put a GPS collar, and this is a solar panel. And then you can uh, maybe say network, OK. Uh, every, you can close enough, long enough by location. Uh, or you can, um, or you can put these colors on baboons, and this is what we did. And we're now developing a system that has more than just GPS, but also a, a Fitbit-like thing where you can do grooming, actual social interaction, social behavior. So uh, let's see a little quiz time. So this is a day in the life of a baboon, of a baboon troop. So we had this, this is several years ago already, we put GPS collars on baboons. They take GPS location every second on all the entire troop for 30 days. So this is a day in the life of. So watch this guy who is right now on the screen. You all are seeing it. Or girl, I don't know. So going back, something happens, right? And then, like, everybody starts moving. Let's do it again. Question for you as you're watching. That one that's going back and forth, male or female, high ranking, low ranking, adult, juvenile, who is that baboon? Right? We'll take a poll. So get, take your guess. OK? So watch. It's coming from the bottom right there. Now it's in the center. Things are happening. OK? Going back, something happened, and then like the whole thing starts moving. Okay? So, who thinks that this is a male? Female? Juvenile? Adult? High ranking? Low ranking? Okay, we're pretty evenly split on high ranking. Okay, tell me your story. The ones who are thinking this is a low ranking male, what do you think he's doing? Anybody, any volunteers? Yes. All okay. right, chased out of a pack. And so then kind of goes back to the original one. Okay, uh, those who think that this is, anybody thinks this is a high ranking female? No, nobody thought it was a high-ranking female. Uh, somebody who thinks this is a high-ranking male, tell me your story. What do you think is happening? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> so you think like he's bringing some buddies with him to go? Okay. The second girl. Okay. 
So he's bringing some buddies with him. So this is the danger of drawing the wrong network. <laughs> because what's really happening there, this is morning, they're waking up, they sleep on the trees over the river, on yellow fever trees over the river, and then they're going to the, all the way to the east side to, to eat. But they have to clo uh, cover this very open space, and there are leopards in the area, so they all kind of have to be together. So the first group is the scouts disposable young males who, <laughs> like, if they, <laughs> if they survive, okay, the rest. So this guy, the guy who's going back and forth, that's the alpha. Once these guys are safe, okay, he's starting to follow, he's, uh, he's going to go, but he wants to get to eat, to be the first one to get there to eat. And so when the, ba the rest of the troop starts following him, he doesn't actually want to bring them with him. What he does there, and we have a video of this whole thing, but I, 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 he, he, he goes back to the troop and asserts his dominance. That's the first assertion of the day. So what he essentially does is kind of stands there and goes like, Hoo! Yeah, and you guys jump, and that's exactly what happens. The rest of the group just goes like, Hoo! okay, fine, go. Yeah. So that's the danger of drawing the wrong network, because the network gives us the sense that he's bringing them with him. No, he's not. So we, we, as I said, have now new sensors where we actually can collect grooming data um, on, on other primate subjects. And the problem is we, we realized that, uh, you notice, there is no Fitbit, not sensor there on the left hand because he's lefty. It turns out baboons are also lefties, so we have to take it into consideration. Um, so I was supposed to, uh, the, the organizers know, I gave them a hard time of trying to find the timing of uh, my coming here uh, because I was supposed to go to Kenya right after this to test the full system of the sensors, we, we, uh, uh, but it didn't work out. And the reason it didn't work out, because we were there in, in, in uh, August and uh, we were supposed to test the sensors in August, but there is right now, due to a fiasco, it was translocated rhinos in Kenya, uh, there is a moratorium on tranquilization, so we had to test it on the closest animal that is like a baboon, but doesn't need tranquilization, which turns out, here's Daisy. <laughs> All right. The other way of collecting information about uh, networks of animals is through photographs. I mean, zebras are walking barcodes, for God's sake, right? So, uh, <laughs> if <laughs> so, so if you get enough uh, data, and right now we have uh, photographs from camera traps, uh, tourists, field assistants, everybody, and so if we could only use the patterns to recognize individual zebras from photographs, we, we would be in business, and in fact, we can. Um, we can start with these photographs, and I'll talk a lot more about it tomorrow, so this is a little preview, and we can pull out all the pictures that contain animals, identify the species and where they are in the photograph, and then down to individual animals. So not only we can tell you this is zebra giraffe, but this is Zippy the zebra, and so anything striped, spotted, wrinkled, or notched, and then uh, with information when and where the image was taken, you can really start building social networks of animals from photographs. So come tomorrow. So time and topology, central dogma. So uh, the, there is structure in time and topology. And what do we mean by that? So structure is how the temporal network differs from a random network or no network at all. So the how part means we need some measure, we need to be able to measure quantities. And the random network or no network at all means we need some notion of a null model. Okay? And uh, the time part means that there's the order of the topology of the network. The fact that I first talk to you, Ben, and then Ben talks to somebody else, and that somebody else talks to somebody else, that order is important. There is causality that some interactions actually cause others. Right? And so, so let's start with network inference. How do we define network? And so this is, um, you know, we, we, we typically think of network as this. Here's a picture of a network. But as you saw, this can be very dangerous because there are many, one, we need to define uh, the network. We also, there are some links may be missing, some individuals may be not tracked. And there's a work recently that started being done on biologists of all people, not 
you know, we, not us, data, people who know that data it has to be dealt with cautiously, but biologists are really starting to raise red flags and saying um, that uh, how to, uh, there are banana scales, there are many pitfalls in uh, data construction. So one of the recent articles on how to do it properly is by Damian Farin from Max Planck, who's my former postdoc, and uh, uh, Ivan Bruger, my current, current PhD student, uh, wrote a we wrote a survey on, in ACM surveys on network inference in, across all the domains. So how do people actually define networks? Turns out it's this dark art of network definition. And so really, the way to think about it is that network is a model. Really. <laughs> Shocking, right? Um, and just like any other model, it's only as good as the information that it gives you about the system and about the question that you're asking on that system. Since networks don't exist, there is no one universal good network. Any network is, like any model, is only as good as the answer it gives you for a particular question, right? And so what should be is not net okay, we have a network, let's start analyzing it. We have a question on data. What is the right best network for that question? So that's the first sort of thing that we do is, and, and we started developing a really principled way of inferring the best network for, the, um, for, for a given question. And it really is about model selection. And so how do you do, in a principled way, this whole um, process of model selection in this space, non-metric space of networks? Um, and, and how do you measure? Because you have, let's say a task is node classification. And now you all know what it means. So you have some missing labels and you want inf to infer uh, them on uh, some nodes. And so you can infer many different networks on, uh, on, on this system. Maybe it's, you can actually have a social network that's given. Maybe you just have label, uh, existing label similarity. Maybe you have long enough or close enough, whatever it is. And then you can say, OK, I'm going to, for, in my inferred network, the missing label of a node is the majority of the labels of its neighbors. Or maybe it's the majority label in the community that it belongs to, just what they do with protein functions, function inference. Or maybe it's, the, uh, uh, it's some ensemble and combination of those. And so each one of these will give you a different answer on what the, the missing labels of the nodes are. And the question is, what is the best network and the, uh, and the model on that network that gives you the right answers for, uh, for the label. And so you can formulate it properly as a learning problem. So you want to learn the network that, given a task, you want to learn the network, right? And now you have a loss function, and your loss function is uh, the, the, when you have in supervised setting, you have training data and uh, uh, test data of the missing labels. And so that gives you your, your proper setting for uh, network learning with the right loss function. In this case, probably, m in most of the cases, you're going to end up, unfortunately, with a Hamming loss. And uh, you can set up your favorite learning method and your favorite uh, uh, model selection. So, given a different task, you may have a different network. So the nice part about it, it also automatically gives you a possibility of saying there is no network. Because if the network that is the best one in this setting is, so is the, the model that is the label of a node is random, because you have to include in this case the null model as the random label, right? Or, sorry, or the majority of the random subset of its neighbors, you know, 
if all of them perform the same way, so there's no model, and the best model is just my past history of labels, <laughs> then in the dynamic setting, then you have no network effect. And so you shouldn't be even using a network in the first place. So that, so I'm going to skip. And so what it does, and we've used this on baboons, uh, testing whether the position, so the label we were interested in, the position of a baboon within a troop, is it in the center, is it in the periphery, right, when the troop is in the move, and so whether the label such as, uh, whether the, the, the uh, demographic characteristic, male, female, adult, subadult, uh, dominant or not, uh, are predictive of the position of a baboon in the troop. Right? So you can ask, is there is there a, a network effect? Turns out there is no network effect. It's not about uh, their inter social interactions. It's, it's personal preferences, right? And you can really test that with a network definition. Okay, questions? Notice I'm not actually talking you through the whole process of learning that network because once you set it up as a learning problem, you can go and choose your own favorite method of uh, your, your, your favorite uh, learning approach. All right, network representation. So once we have network definition, particularly for dynamic networks, we can represent it as a, as a stream of edges. So in this case, each line is a node, and then you can just uh, draw these edges. Uh, you can represent it as a s as explicitly as a stream of edges, so now each line is an edge, so now you have quadratic storage space. Um, and so both of these can be either events, the edges as events, or as intervals that have duration. Okay? And then you can also aggregate it as a... So both of these are lossless representations. We're not losing information. You can aggregate it as a labeled graph, which is uh, not a commonly used uh, representation for a good reason because it's, uh, it's confusing, even though it's still a lossless representation. But we, well, it's not a lossless representation. You can, you can infer most of the information from it um, and becomes messy with intervals. Right? Okay. So um, here's the thing. And what we commonly see is, is this, but without the labels the aggregate, what we call an aggregate network, right? Once you lose the labels, once you stop using the labels, that means that the order of the interactions is lost. And many different uh, networks, dynamic networks, can result in the same static uh, aggregate graph. And that is a problem, right? So, and you all now can aggregate it, right? <laughs> no. So the thing is, we, we're used to seeing this, the, the, the networks like this. We're not used to seeing representations like this. But, uh, so we really want to kind of go from this to some version of a network. And what we do typically, we discretize the network. So we, we partition the timeline in some unit intervals, and we say that, uh, uh, that, that, that we, we represent the network within each interval uh, as this sort of aggregate of this. And by this, we mean that all the interactions that happened within that time window could have happened in any order. Why is that good or bad? So why would you even want to aggregate? You're losing information, right? So the thing is, if you look at typical networks, and let's say our baboons, we sampled in every second, not much changes from second to second. And when you think of email networks, maybe there is an email or two that happen within one second interval. And it really doesn't matter that this was sent before this, but if you aggregate over, let's say, t uh, 20 seconds or a minute, you, it is really important that all of these interactions, all of these emails happen before all of these emails. Right? That's what happens in aggregation. But at some point, when you aggregate too much, you lose the important order. And so, turns out, there are natural scales, time scales, of most of interaction, dynamic interaction networks. There's this beautiful paper 
uh, unfortunately named on non-stationarity of human contact networks uh, from a group in Cambridge University. But the thing is, yes, it's non-stationary in statistical sense, but there is a clear pattern, there are clear scales of human interactions, right? Here's the, um, this is a scale in hours, right? So this is, these are days, these are weeks, and there's a weekend, <laughs> right? And these are months. So the run, there, there is a very good rhythm to, 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 the, to human interactions. There are scales. And we need to be able to look at the networks at the right scale. And even, in, so if you look at the stationarity, we showed, uh, this is my former PhD student, student uh, Raymond Casares, any noisy stationary probabilistic process that generates the edge stream which is oversampled at a factor W. So you, you know, things happen on the order of days, let's say, in humans, but if you just sample it once a day, you're actually not going to see the pattern. You have to sam sample multiple times per day to see the pattern on the order of days. Right? So if you oversample this uh, at a factor W, then it will be stationary at a aggregation window W and not less. So the, if you, there is a natural time scale in the process, then you will be able to find it by aggregated just to the right, uh, to the right uh, window. And again, if the process is stationary, it's nice because you can just optimize for it. But most, unfortunately, most the interaction processes are not stationary. So we can use all kinds of approaches, again, to learn the right time scale that minimizes uh, the trade-off between, essentially, uh, in noise to signal ratio in however you measure it. So one way to measure it is a very quick and dirty way, and there are much more sophisticated ways of doing it. You can look at your uh, network density. So by the way, any linear transformation on the adjacency matrix will work, but density and or average degree is a nice linear transformation on the adjacency matrix. Um, so you can look at the network density at different levels of aggregation and look at the variance versus compression ratio. Compression ratio is a nice signal uh, proxy empirically. And so then you can really find the just right kind of window of aggregation. We call this uh, algorithm twin, temporal window in network al algorithmics. And here's what happens. When you look at networks that are, uh, so this is the infamous Enron network, which uh, this was an energy company in the uh, US that did legal things. And uh, thanks to that, their entire network of emails was subpoenaed and we've been analyzing their networks ever since. So if you look at a network which is at a too fine time scale, then uh, it's noisy, right? If you aggregate it too much, you lose important, important uh, inter events that happen there. And just right, this is the just right, turns out four to five hours is the just right. You actually see the three subpoena events, the, and, sorry, the subpoena events, the three ma major events, and when everybody ran to, to their lawyers and so on. Again, in a, a computer network here, uh, at the right level, you see here an attack happened on the network, a hacking attack. But if you aggregate too much, you don't see. You see regime changes at the right levels, you see periodicity, and so on. So the scale is important, and in fact, when you uh, analyze the network at the right scale with the right node, with the right uh, definition of an edge, you find out interesting things. So for baboons, what we found out uh, is, oops, is that baboons have two temporal scales. And actually, most primates probably do. So the long temporal scale uh, the decision of, so this is on the order of, this is seconds, so this is 10 seconds and further, so the 10, 20, sorry, minutes. Uh, so at the longer term scale, 
of about 20 minutes, the decision where to go. So the most predictive network of where you're going to be about 20 minutes from now is four to six, the location of your four to six most frequent interactions. It's four to six friends. Right? That's how longer-term decisions of where to go are made. So when you decide of where you're going to go for dinner, it's your four to, in, if you're a baboon, it's four to six uh, uh, your most frequent interactions. But exactly on the shorter scale, temporal scale, whether you're going to go left or right around the bush and you know, start moving or not, that decision, the most predictive network, is four to six nearest neighbors the proximity one. And that is interesting for two reasons. So one, that there is two scales and two different networks and we need to analyze them separately. The other part is that the four to six is most predictive, not the entire population of 28 baboons, not your three nearest neighbors, but four to six. And so, so just like in humans, there is an important how much we can keep track of, how many objects we can keep track of. Most of us is about seven to nine. Some people can do 11. Um, but in, in baboons, it turns out it's four to six. All right. So, questions? How much do I have? I'm sorry. Is it half an hour? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's mo get moving. Okay. So, dynamic networks. Uh, so we, we already, uh, so we decided on this representation, let's start doing things with dynamic networks. One of the things that people like doing is, uh, is look at important nodes and uh, pathways in dynamic networks. So we need to define what a pathway is in dynamic network. Um, when the thing is, when we, there are many, as I said, many dynamic networks that result in the same aggregate version. And when we talk about paths in dynamic network, they have to, have to happen in a temporal order. So you can only move from one node to another if there is an edge at that time step between the two nodes, right? So here, four different paths between U and X, and they all happen in different temporal order, right? So when we talk about shortest paths in dynamic networks, it really, we can go in many different directions. We can say, okay, it's shortest temporal path, maybe the one that uh, takes the least amount of time, or maybe it's the least number of links, or um, th that in this case is the bottom two, or, and the one that's, the, the highlighted one is, is the one that both shortest number of links and the shortest amount of time. And so, uh, uh, one of the first things then with, so we can redefine all the quantities that we know, we want for, for, know for static networks, for dynamic networks, by using this temporal definition of paths. So one of the, um, so because of the time, I'm actually going to skip network prediction part. One of the first things wa people want to do with networks, given a network, dynamic network, is, okay, what's the next time step? What is it going to look like, right? So that's network prediction, and that's the part that I'm going to very much skip because it requires a full introduction into adversarial um, uh, approach, <laughs> and that's going to take a while. So uh, you cannot sagely as I'm going through this <laughs> very quickly. Here, okay. Uh, aha moment, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. All right. Central dogma number two. So that nodes and links in a network actually have positions. So, and some positions, all positions are equal, but some are more important than others. Um, and position is how a node or link is connected or related to the rest of the network in structure and time. Again, the how part is we need, means we need to measure quantities. The rest of the network means we need to be able to compare networks. And the time part 
we means we somehow have to quantify and distinguish between cause and effect. And uh, you all, thankfully, now have heard a wonderful talk on causality, right? So now this is it. All right. So one of the first things that people look at networks, in dynamic networks especially, is the spreading processes, right? How, spread, how information and uh, how networks facilitate the spread of information or diseases. And uh, so let's say we have something that started with uh, uh, v and Z, nodes V and Z, and then they can pass it on to their neighbors. Um, and now we have uh, V, Z, U and W have that piece of information, and then they can share with their neighbors and so on. And so now every, almost everybody in the network except for those two guys are in the possession of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, everybody in the network at the end has that bit of information. And so there are a couple of ways that information spreads in the network, and we typically talk about independent cascade, which means that uh, every such transmission happens independently with a fixed probability of an uh, over an edge. Okay, that's the independent cascade model. And then, uh, so, um, and linear threshold means that every node has an unique threshold of uh, the fraction, the weighted fraction of neighbors that have to have the that ha that have to have the information before this node becomes also in the possession of information, or adopts the behavior, or becomes infected with the disease. Right. So. Uh, so typically in opinion changing or behavior changing uh, processes, we use the uh, linear threshold model for diseases is quite often the uh, independent cascade models. So here the node, uh, here the node, uh, uh, let's say the majority, at least half of my neighbors have to, have, a, uh, have to ask me to do something before I will do something. Right? So, so here this is what it will look like. Um, this process, and notice with independent cascade, everybody at the end became uh, infected, and here only some nodes are not. Okay, so one of the th first things people want to do in then is given a network and some uh, spreading process on that network, find the initial set of nodes that will be most influential that will maximize the number of affected nodes in the end under some spreading model, right? So that's the influence maximization process. So whom should you market your product to, right? If you have a fixed budget to, for marketing and you can just give away a hundred different free samples, whom should you give it to to ensure that the largest number of nodes in the network will adopt the product, right? Okay. So in general, it's an NP-hard problem, not surprisingly. There are uh, quite effective greedy approximation algorithms that also work in a dynamic network. That essentially, uh, you find at every step the largest, uh, so you randomly start with uh, some node, and you, at every time step, you sorry, and you find the largest, iteratively the largest, the node with the largest number of downstream cascade nodes that it can affect to add to your initial set. Okay. So that's a non-learning approach. And turns out that not all influence processes work this way. So when we looked at baboons or human data or, we, uh, or a couple of other time series data and asked, so biologists that I work with ask us, how do social animals make decisions? Right? How do leaders emerge? How does, uh, who is a leader? Who is the initiator of a process? And it's not about spreading information quite often because there are different models. Right. There can be the model where it's this word of mouth, kind of, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's start moving. Or, you know, everybody follows that alpha male, or there is a hierarchy, or I'm just going to go with my friend and I don't care about what else everybody else says. 
So it turns out, in, uh, it was a good indication, indicator that uh, shared decision-making processes, so a, a form of this influence uh, maximization somehow, uh, is actually uh, uh, is a model that's, that, that works, works for baboons. So we, we started out figuring out how we, we put a formal uh, framework to, to really find the um, decision points and the model behind it in baboons or other uh, time series data. So we start with multidimensional time series data, right? So whether it's the traces of baboon movement or the, uh, the, 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 the sequences of your behavior or your uh, publication record or the, 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 the click-throughs on uh, your customers. So any kind of time series data. And then uh, we infer what we call a following, dynamic following network, a network of who follows whom. And I'll talk a little in, in, in a, a little bit about it. And then in that network, we find the time segments of when everybody comes to consensus and coalesces around a particular behavior. But the interesting thing is, if you think about it, once you've found everybody all going in the same direction, this is not when the decisions are happening. By the time everybody's going in the same direction, it's too late to look for a decision point because the decision happens before that. If you want to find the initiator, the leader, it, you have to look at pre-coordination to find who initiated this, everybody going in the same direction. And that's what we do, and then we, uh, again, uh, look at different measures. So our features are different properties of that initiator that we identify, as well as the uh, behavior of the population as a, as, as a whole, and we do proper sort of model selection on, uh, uh, on, on the, the, the model of behavior, of coordinated behavior. Okay, so back to our baboons. Same ones, same alpha, now in black, kind of running back and forth, sped up quite a bit, right? And the way we, so, so notice, if we look at the traces of what happened, there were moments when they all coalesced and kind of followed more or less the same direction. And in fact, at the beginning, they all finally decided to move. They all moved. Uh, and then they all moved in the same way for a while, then they split and coalesced again. So who initiated this full coordination? How did it, this happen? That's the question that we're trying to answer. And the way we do it is by, uh, through a couple of definitions, so the follow relation, if you look at time, at, at two time series, uh, U and W, U follows W, we say that U follows W if they're, let's say, identical or similar enough when we start relaxing those definition, but with a time delay, right? Uh, we say that a whole group is coordinated if everybody follows somebody. Right? They're all following together. And finally, uh, the initiator of this coordinated behavior is the first one who started it. Ta-da! <laughs> right? so, uh, so in pictures it looks like this. You, know, you have this t two time series and they kind of follow each other if they are similar but with a time delay. Uh, and you can infer this dynamic network of following and then, once you have a dynamic network of following at the right time scale, which you can learn, um, you can look at the density of this following network. When everybody follows everybody, then there is an edge between every two nodes, and the density is high. And so that means that if you look at this density threshold above certain density, that's the, the coordinated time frame. And so the decision happens right before it, the coordination, and uh, indeed you can uh, find these coordinated periods and find the individual who was followed by most individuals, who are followed by most individuals, who are followed by most individuals, which is the very definition of page rank. And in fact, page rank was, uh, when first was defined in 1930s, was essentially for the purpose of identifying leaders. And so here's an example of what it looks like, because the one who runs at the front is not necessarily, when everybody already knows where they're going, right, is not necessarily uh, the one who started it. 
And so here's uh, the, the network density of a particular behavior and the three snapshots, which is right before when this individual uh, big black circle is initiating it and then gradually everybody starts following and then the blue one, who is a juvenile male, starts running up front and kind of like, yeah, I know where you're going. All right. And so, and then what you can do is, is um, use a lot of different features. So not only the page rank and the order of page rank as different features for your uh, models, but you can also look at, uh, and I can, I'm happy to talk a lot more of why we looked at it, the convex hull and which individuals break the convex hull. Who are the individuals who are move outside of the convex hull of the position of the rest of the group or the velocity or the, the direction angle. So those are also good features, turns out to look at. And so based on all these features, you can do, again, you can learn the model of coordination. Uh, you can train the models on different uh, models such as, okay, random or follow the dictator or hierarchical or linear threshold, or you, you can add your different favorite models of, uh, of sort of coordinated behavior and decision making and train a classifier on these models and then ask, my particular one, which kind is it? Turns out baboons indeed are this linear threshold based decision model. Okay. So um, again, I'm going to... So finally, from network science, another thing that people are really, really are interested quite a bit is similar nodes tend to interact with other, uh, with each other, uh, more frequently, and this is homophily versus influence. So, are we here in this room because somebody uh, else whom you respect and is interested in machine learning said, "Oh, you should really come to here, right, and learn about machine learning," or are you here because you're already interested? Are we here because these are the people who are already a priori interested in machine learning and we all got together, right? So are the links because we have similar interests or do you end up being interested in machine learning because you had a link to somebody who was interested, right? Those are the two scenarios that we're trying to distinguish, right? And so influence, we talked about inference, but the other form is community. The links already exist, the links uh, are formed because of the common interest similarity. Uh, so communities are groups of nodes that are connected to each other more than they are connected to other nodes. And with this definition, again, the more part means we need to measure quantities. And the other, they connected to each other more than to other nodes, we need to compare. And in fact, this whole definition is Clustering, right? It's collection of, of uh, points that are closer to each other than they are to, to, to points to, to in other clusters. Which means by looking at you, I cannot tell whether this is a community. I need to look at this group of nodes in the context of a larger network. Okay? And um, so, but this is again, as a static snapshot, sure, we know how to do static clustering. But what about dynamic? What about something where we want um, a version of like, look, if I look at these time steps, and I, let's say I even observe groupings, not even network, but like full groups. So I have these, let's say zebras, one, two, and three together, and then four by itself, five by itself, and next time step they kind of regroup. Uh, then I'm missing three all together, but these two are together by itself, by itself. Can I? find some cohesive version of this that says, okay, there are three communities, the uh, five is the core, two like visited, then joined, four is the core of the green one, and there are some, you know, two again is kind of occasionally uh, one time joined and then left and so on. So how do we do this? And the thing is, in the, uh, uh, so the definition in social sciences is that communities are cohesive subgroups of actors among whom there are relatively strong, direct, intense, frequent, or positive, shiny, sparkling, uh, bubbly ties. And um, if community is a cluster, then dynamic community means that we need to find some measure, some social 
cost some social space which, where we can compare the closeness of two nodes over time. And so, uh, luckily we can, there is such notion of social cost, is that, that, that there are essentially three uh, postulates, that one is the individuals, if there is such notion of, as communities, if there is actually community that drives our inter interactions that we observe, then individuals are reluctant to switch community affiliations, but they can, but there is a cost. So a baboon can leave its troop and go somewhere else and join another one. You can move from one city to another, you can change jobs, but there is a cost. And it's, this cost is measurable both in humans and all the other animals. And when you switch community affiliation, your stress hormones go up, harassment levels go up typically, access to resources often drops, or there is at least a change, and th there's a change in the social status. Um, similarly, you can, uh, individuals are seen mostly with their own community, but they can visit others, but there is a cost, again, which is very measurable. And in some species and in some instances, contexts, the visiting cost is higher than the switching one. So my cell phone network, right, the, the, the other pro network providers make it very hard, very high cost to, to, to visit uh, a different network, but low to switch. But in other cases, moving a city is much, much more expensive than, uh, than just visiting. And finally, there is, uh, individuals are rarely absent from their own community, uh, but uh, they can, but there is a cost of absence, which in social sciences is known as cost of lost opportunity. Okay, and so we can formulate this whole thing as a nice optimization problem, as uh, find the community structure that explains the observed interactions, that minimizes the overall cost for all the individuals of switching, visiting, and uh, absence. Right, so we can do it through this graph representation where we have nodes for individuals and the observed groups, groupings, and the individual is connected to a group that it was observed in, and we want to find the coloring of the nodes where the groups in the same time step have different colors, because you, you know, if they're meeting, means they're three different communities. Uh, and every time an individual switches its color from one time to another, it's a switching cost. When an individual is not connected to a group node of the same color, it means that it's absent from its community, so it's an absence cost. And when it's connected to a community of a different color, mean, to, to a group of a different color, it means it's visiting. Uh, and has to pay visiting cost. So again, this problem is NP-hard, but there are nice approximation algorithms. But what's also interesting is that even though it is a combinatorial optimization problem, and NP-hard one and that, there's an equivalent probabilistic model where uh, individuals start with uh, community affiliation, and then at each time step, they can, there is a probability of switching or visiting a community, and as long as the probability of switching or visiting a different community is less than half, the maximum likelihood, likelihood you can prove that the maximum likelihood fit of this model to observed interaction data is the same as the parsimony formulation, as the optimi optimal solution. All right. So cost of optimal coloring is the maximum likelihood. So what does it give us? Back to our baboons. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip the baboons. I'm going to go straight to zebras. All right. <laughs> so, um, so this is a, a nine-month observation network of uh, a zebra population. And uh, if I showed you the aggregate network, which is in, this red, in the uh, yellow circle, and I would ask you, show me a community there. Come on, point to something in the yellow circle. What's the community there? The blob, right? I mean, obviously, this blob is the community. Well, if we look at the dynamic network on the uh, right, then uh, this blob, and I will help you by coloring the nodes f by the majority color in the dynamic setting, so the time in the dynamic setting goes top to bottom, and the coloring is given by the hour algorithm. It's the optimal coloring. So in this blob, 
there are red nodes and green nodes, and there are a couple of pink-ish nodes that are completely just visiting and not part of the community. But the red and, and green ones are this one big community, which is the, the green on the left is the stallion, the male, and the rest is his harem. The green nodes are lactating females, and the red nodes are non-lactating females. And there is very good reason why there are two different communities, because they have different ecological resources. The lactating females have to go to water and stay uh, and, sp and drink a lot more, but it's much more dangerous. So the, green, the uh, red nodes, the non-lactating females, go to greener pastures with fewer lions. Right. So this notion that there is ecological reasons and uh, uh, that that form these communities, and and not only that, the dynamics of their community behavior. So you can measure for each node, uh, create the features of the number of uh, the number of uh, 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 switches, visits, the size of the community, duration of the community, purity. I mean, you go nuts, create your own features, and. Now, each node is embedded in this multidimensional space of the community dynamics. And I'm like, community dynamics. And, and you can ask, you can do, you know, uh, you can do node classification, you can cluster, you can do uh, lots of things with this embedding. And one of them is, turns out, very, very simple. If you look at the, at, at, at sort of, here I will help you. So these are lactating females, non-lactating stallions and bachelors and they occupy very different parts of this dynamic space, which means the biology drives the dynamics of their social interactions. And if you compare zebras to very similar species, onagers, wild donkeys, that have same size and, uh, size and physiology, and they also are territorial males with harem females. Um, and, uh, but if you look at their uh, dynamic networks, even just by this, they look very different because, and this is quiz time, last quiz time, because these two species represent two very different reasons, the extreme reasons of why animals are social in the first place. Because biologists will tell you that there are two, one uh, reason why animals are social, why they put aside the competition and share the resources, is that there is a constraint of resources. The, we all have to go, they all have to go to the same water hole or the same coffee shop. It's not that we like each other in the same coffee shop. We just learn to tolerate each other to access the common resource, shared resource. And in cases like that, what you will find that the species that are constrained by social because they're constrained by resources, their dynamic, uh, their communities are going to be kind of pretty uh, well mixed. There is no consistency or persistence or coherence. On the other extreme, uh, animals are social because they're uh, looking for, searching for strength in numbers to uh, protect themselves from danger. The extreme case of that being birds, flocks of birds and schools of fish. If you are as similar to everybody else as possible, then maybe the predator will not go after you. But you have to be able to trust those around you. You have to have some history of interaction to know that you're not going to be left alone screaming your radical opinion on the corner, that others will come to your aid, right? Uh, and so in cases like that, the networks are much more cohesive. And so one of these species is constrained by resources. The other one uh, is seeking strength in numbers to avoid predators. So which one is afraid of predators? Left, right? Because it is indeed much more... All right. The battery, I think, is dead. The left one is much more cohesive. They have lions. The onagers, the wild asses, they don't have lions, but they're constrained by water holes. And uh, in fact, if you look again at this embedding in the feature space, uh, you'll see that not only the gravis and the onagers occupy very different parts of it, but the females and the males, so you have these four different quadrants that uh, lead to a hypothesis about the different evolutionary pathways of social behavior in this case. So uh, with that, I'm actually going to uh, stop and uh, thank my... So uh, there are lots... There is not a lot of software for dynamic network analysis, uh, typically, what you end up is writing your own R packages or Python packages, and then uh, everybody else just says, oh, but I don't need exactly that. I need slightly different and rewriting. Um, so 
unlike in static networks, we're just still developing, and this is my own wonderful network of collaborators um, and uh, people who contributed to this. Thank you.